paradise. For a team of researchers and filmmakers, it was the end of a long trail in search of the eye eye, one of the rarest mammals in the world. The village of Mahambo on the northeast coast was the last place on the mainland of Madagascar where the eye eye had been seen, but that was in 1966. The search team went there to investigate rumours that it still survived. Soon after they arrived, they found a coconut bearing strange tooth marks. Georges Randriansolo, director of the Tananarive Zoo, thought they might be on the right trail. The eye eye is known to eat coconuts. As he explored the village, Georges found more coconuts with the same markings, some of them still on the palm. It was suggested that these could have been made by rats. Georges thought not. Photographs of the eye, eye were shown to the villagers of Mahambo and they were asked if they'd seen this animal recently. Did it in fact still exist here? In 1976, the only eye, eye known to be alive was a solitary male in the zoo at Tananarive, the capital of Madagascar. The eye, eye is a species of lemur, a very ancient order of primates. They discovered what the captive eye, eye liked to eat by trial and error. Eye eyes are nocturnal. They sleep during the day in a solidly built nest made of twigs and leaves. The male in the zoo was checked each morning by Georges and his assistant. By day, eye eyes are timid and retiring creatures. The chances of seeing one while it is light, even in captivity, are pretty slender. The search for surviving wild eye eyes led to an island off the northeast coast of Madagascar. From Tananarive in the central highlands, it is about 800 kilometers by road to the north. The island, called Nozi Mangabe, is an uninhabited nature reserve which was thought to contain some survivors. The drive up the coast took the team including naturalist camera crew Liz and Tony Bomford, across coastal swamps full of palms and mangroves, frogs and mosquitoes. Their reasons for toiling all the way up here arose from the work of a French scientist called Dr. Jean-Jacques Petter, who had chosen Nosy Mangabe as the place where the eye could be given one more chance. The island lies a few kilometers off the coast in the sheltered bay of Antongil. It was never permanently inhabited and was declared a reserve in 1966 after Dr. Petter and government officials had released nine surviving eye eyes to join those already living on its steep forested slopes. A few small thatched huts standing near the shore are used occasionally by fishermen. Most of them were derelict when the island came under legal protection, as Dr. Petter's own film of the occasion shows. Coconuts were provided for the eye eyes in 1966. When the reserve was created, the forestry department planted new coconut palms. The eye eyes which were to be released on the island in the hope that they would breed in safety were collected during 1965 by Dr. Petter and the government officials he worked closely with. One of them was only a baby at the time and at first had to be fed from a bottle. The reason for the eye eyes endangered status is partly that the Malagasy people believe it to be the earthly messenger of an evil spirit. Its fingers are a potent charm in local medicine. More drastically, its forest home has and is being felled at an alarming rate for charcoal, agricultural use and road building. The island seemed to be the only sanctuary left.
This scene from the old film records the last time wild eye eyes were seen by scientists, as the last of the nine was released into the forest on Nosy Mangabe. There was a plan for a continuing research program on the island and a laboratory was built there, but it was used only by occasional visitors. Pressing political and economic problems diverted attention from a small and insignificant animal. While local naturalists had collected plants there for medicinal purposes, Tony and Liz Bomford were the first foreign naturalists to work on Nosy Mangabe. The island was very much as they'd expected, deserted and overgrown. Two and a half square kilometers of jungle protected by the Indian Ocean and the laws of Madagascar. The young coconut palms were surrounded by dense underbrush and evidently no one had been coming to the island to collect the nuts, so some of them had germinated and grown into trees. On the team's first short trip into the dark forest of the interior, they encountered a lemur, but not an eye, eye. This was a roughed lemur, eating the fruits of a wild fig tree. Not all lemurs are nocturnal. This one continued feeding, apparently unperturbed, while it was being watched. Clustered together on a snake liana stem, the white feathery larvae of Fulgaroidea. Clustering together makes them very conspicuous to birds, but they're also poisonous, so birds soon learn to leave them well alone. Their protective display guards the little insects from reptiles which would otherwise attack. Striped skinks are common on the forest floor. The large rhinoceros beetle is found all over the tropics as a pest of coconut palms. The giant millipede, which can grow to over 30 centimeters long, is known in East Africa as a Mombasa train. The island seemed undisturbed and fully exploited by a rich and complex fauna and flora. Hanging motionless, a chameleon tries to look like a leaf. Only its swiveling eyes give its presence away. The Bomford's search took on a new excitement as they penetrated further into the forest. A dead tree trunk showed signs of having been chewed at by something looking for grubs under the bark. This is a characteristic feeding method of the eye eye. Further in and more evidence of the eye eye's activities. Making camp near the deserted laboratory, they planned to go out into the forest that night to see what they could find. The laboratory makes a sad sight in the sunshine. All its promise faded, but at least the undisturbed forest behind was full of potential. As the light faded, the party set off into the forest, wearing headlamps to leave their hands free for photography and to help them through the dense undergrowth. Georges led the way by the same path that they had made that afternoon. But by night, the forest was a completely unfamiliar place.
Another tree trunk with the marks of the grub hunter. But this one was different. The marks appeared to be recent. Round the other side of the trunk, Georges quietly directed their gaze to the ground. This was the first positive evidence that the I.I. still survives on Nosy Mangabe. The chippings on the ground here were fresh. Georges felt certain that they had been made the previous night. As they pressed on up the steep slope, they looked for the flash of eyes in the darkness. Most nocturnal animals have reflective eyes, but the viewer needs to be looking along the beam of his light to see them. A handheld lamp illuminates the animal, a mouse lemur in this instance, but the telltale eye shine shows up best with a headlamp. The forest was full of pairs of glowing eyes, all of them lemurs of one kind or another and each had to be quietly and carefully investigated. Finally, one pair actually seemed to be approaching them, near enough to get the camera light ready. Whatever it was, it was climbing down a tree. When the lights came up, their search was over. There, chewing unconcernedly on a beetle grub, was their first wild eye eye. Its hand had the typically elongated middle finger, the one that is supposed to be such a powerful talisman. The team were delighted to find Ai Ai's alive and healthy on the island. Now they could turn their search to the mainland. When people came to Madagascar about 1500 years ago, there were lemurs all over the huge island in the dense rainforests of the north and further south where the forest is drier. These are ring-tailed lemurs which now live in a few remaining forests in south and southwestern Madagascar. The ring-tail is a social animal with complex behaviour patterns designed to keep the group together. Southern Madagascar is much drier than the north and the ringtails get moisture where they can. They use their beautiful tails as signal flags to keep the group together and to express their moods to each other. The smallest of the Madagascar lemurs has the widest range, living wherever a few trees or scrubland remains. It's the tiny mouse lemur. It lives on insects and fruit, and it's strictly nocturnal. Excluding its slender tail, a mouse lemur is about 10 centimetres long. This mother has a half-grown family. Since humans came to Madagascar, the lemurs have found themselves being steadily deprived of their forest habitat. Since their arrival, people have cut down trees and burned the undergrowth. 
the mouse lemur is still the commonest of the 26 surviving species of lemur, but that's partly because it's small and adaptable. The Indri is in a much more precarious position. It lives only in the mountainous region on the east coast. The Malagasy people used to have a series of powerful taboos against killing the larger lemurs. They regarded them as distant relatives and believed that their ancestral spirits lived on within these primates. Now though, the taboos, or fadies as they're called, are breaking down and Indri are good to eat. As the forests dwindle around them, the Indri have become seriously threatened by woodsmen, farmers and hunters. Today, they are rarely seen. They live in groups of between three to five individuals, which normally comprises an adult pair and their offspring. The black and white ruffed lemur, sometimes called variegated because of its panda-like markings, lives in the eastern rainforest. It eats a lot of fruit, but also feeds on nectar, seeds and leaves, depending on the season. In the far south of Madagascar, there's an arid region sometimes called the Thorny Desert because the dominant species is a cactus-like plant called Dideria. Among these hostile-looking trees lives one of the most spectacular of all the lemurs, a close relation of the Indri called Veros Shifaka. Its yelping call still echoes among the remaining trees, but the story here in the parched south is the same as for the rainforest further north. The trees are going and the animals with them. The dominant plant in the old forest areas is now grass and that's heavily overgrazed by cattle and goats. Apart from its beauty, the Shifaka has another endearing quality. It's a superb athlete bounding from branch to branch, even among the spiny dideria. Shifakas are threatened by the crop raising system practiced by the Malagasy people. It's known as Tavi agriculture. When the first settlers made the voyage to this immense island, they found that much of it was forested. They cut clearings to grow food, burned out the brush to fertilize the soil, and when the little patch of ground was exhausted, they moved on. Their descendants are still doing it. Forests are fragile environments. Remove the trees, exhaust the nutrient supplies in the earth with one or two crops, and the next rainy season will wash the soil away, never to return. It took 1,500 years to denude the land of trees, and it would take several hundred of complete protection before a semblance of the forest would return to what is now open grassland. The practice of Tavi agriculture is illegal only in nature reserves. Elsewhere, it still continues as the traditional method of cultivation.
This was the background which confronted the search team as they travelled north to the tiny village of Mahambo to look for surviving Ayais. Alima, which depends on forest for its home, and which is also regarded as an evil spirit, would seem to have no chance at all outside strict reserves. Hence their excitement at finding that there were some surviving at Mahambo. Georges Randriancelo questioned the villagers about their attitudes to the animals. They had already revealed that Ayais were regularly seen around the village. A girl showed him one feeding at dawn. As they talked, he learned some unexpected information. Not everyone in Madagascar thinks the Ayai brings bad luck. Some communities think of them as a good omen. At Mahamba, though, the people do regard them as an evil influence. But here, the ritual specialist, the local equivalent of a shaman or witch doctor, believed he possessed more spiritual influence than the lemurs. To prove the point, no one was allowed to kill one. Now, for the first time in the growing daylight, the travellers were able to watch an eye opening a coconut, making the characteristic tooth marks they had seen on husks on the ground. The peculiar structure of the eye's hand with its very thin, probe-like middle finger, enables it to winkle grubs out from their burrows in trees, or in this case, the meat from the coconut. First, though, it dips its finger rapidly in and out, running it between its lips after each dip to lick the juice off. When the juice is all gone, it uses the large claw on the end as a spoon to scoop out the jelly-like meat. The eyes at Mahambo are safeguarded by an unusual spiritual belief. Although in many places they are killed as bearers of ill omen, eyes are not as threatened as scientists once feared. Although they may still be endangered, recent research has shown that they may in fact be one of the most widely distributed lemurs on Madagascar, and the wild population may number a few thousand. Good news for this strangest of all Madagascar's lemurs, which only a few years ago was thought to be close to extinction.